All right. Thank you, Kara. And good afternoon. Um, I know I'm first up after lunch, so I will try to keep this as dry as possible so, <laughs> so that you guys can stay awake. But um, glad to be back um, doing this a second time. So as Kara said, I'm now at CDRH. Um, this uh, presentation is uh, less um, focused on drugs. It can be um, apply to any application that you have. So for anyone that's in the room or on the phone, if you think that this is going to be just for drugs, don't worry. I got you guys covered. This is going to be for everyone. So let me go ahead and get started. All right. Poll question. Yay. Poll question. So we've got the poll online. Um, I'll pull you guys in the room. So how many times has your facility by, been inspected by the FDA? So let's see. Never. Have you never had an inspection? Ever. Oh, a few of you. All right. Okay. One time. Once. Okay. A few more. Two to five times. More than five times. All right. So we got a pretty good uh, kind of cross over all the, the options here. And so it's, it's either never or more than five times. <laughs> so, so in the room, we've kind of crossed everything, but online, it's kind of all or nothing. So that's fine. Um, so for those who have, you know, you've gone through this several times, um, hopefully I will provide something that you haven't experienced or some new information that you can take back with you. And for those who have never had an FDA inspection before, hopefully this will kind of ease your uh, apprehension a little bit and you can go into um, an inspection whenever that may come, or if it, if it won't, you'll be ready to go when that happens. So, all right, let's get started. So, Farinac, uh went over the objectives of the FDA, FDA BIMO program in her presentation, so I'll just briefly cover that. So, we're most focused on protection of uh, protection of the rights, the safety, and welfare of our subjects. That's you know the most important thing that we want to um, protect here is making sure that the human subjects or, or animal um, subjects that are involved in clinical trials are protected. That's our, our, our main concern here. And secondly, to not only ensure that they're protected, but the data that is generated from the clinical trials is, is uh, verifiable, is reliable, is accurate. We can count on it when sponsors submit their data to the FDA. And lastly, we want to make sure that we are assessing the compliance with uh, an investigator's, um, their compliance with the regulations that govern the conduct of a con conducting a clinical trial. So whether it be for informed consent forms, uh, for um, you know, conducting the protocol, we want to make sure that the investigators are um, compliant with the FDA regulations. All right. So we're going to go through basically the whole inspectional process from before you know FDA is going to show up until the, you receive your uh, copy of your report in the uh, mail from FDA. So I'll go over the inspection pre-announcement. The opening meeting, what happens once FDA shows up on your doorstep, um, a facility tour, equipment overview at your facility, uh, record review, any common FDA uh, form, form FDA 43 observations, closeout meeting, and some updated guidance documents um, and other resources that I have available to you. All right, it's Monday morning, or maybe it's not Monday morning, maybe it's Wednesday afternoon and you get a phone call from your study coordinator and they say, uh, FDA just called and they said they want to come do an inspection. And so now you're scrambling. You don't know what to do. Or maybe you do know what to do. That's good. But most of our inspections are going to be pre-announced. So um, if there is um, a marketing application that has been submitted to the agency, that's the most common reason why an inspection uh, will be conducted at a facility. If there is um, a report from IRB that there's been some investigator noncompliance that will also trigger an inspection. So there are a few different reasons why FDA may show up on your door. And most of the time, we're going to let you know we're coming. So we don't want to get there and the records are, you know, in an archiving facility that's 30 miles outside of the city. You know, we want to make sure that when we show up, the records are there. So that makes the process easier for both FDA and it makes the process easier for your site. And I know the sponsors who are either in the room or on the phone 
love when their sites call and say, FDA is coming next Monday, and they book the first flight out to that site. You can absolutely do that. However, the inspection is not of the sponsor. It's not of the sponsor. It's not of anything the sponsor is responsible of. The sponsor representative can absolutely be present to you know, provide any guidance to that site, any of the staff. But the interaction between the FDA investigator and the site should not be with the sponsor. So you can absolutely send a sponsor representative, but don't expect to have much influence on the inspection. OK, so you have your pre-announcement. Uh, generally, the FDA investigator will give you a window of about three to five business days. Um, and what they will do is tell you uh, what study they're coming to inspect. They'll tell you um, what records need to be what records need to be available when they show up. So, and basically that's everything. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit further on here. And of course, you guys want to know well, how long are you going to be here? <laughs> so, that's a difficult question to answer before the inspection has actually started. Um, and so, the investigator may give you a window, but please note that that may shorten or it may be longer depending on what the investigator uncovers during their inspection. I'm going to stop saying investigator because I know that can be a little bit confusing. So I will refer to the FDA investigator as a CSO. Is that a term that you guys have heard before? Yes? OK. So a CSO is a consumer safety officer. And so that's kind of a generic term for an FDA employee. And so I'll refer to the FDA investigator that is conducting the inspection as a CSO and then investigator as the clinical investigator. So there's no confusion there. Sorry about that. OK. So the CSO, and I know it says FDA investigator there, <laughs> but at least it will say FDA investigator. There's so many investigators. Anyway, I don't know why they gave us that factor. So the CSO or FDA investigator, they'll present their credentials and they'll issue a 482. So the Form 482 is a notice of inspection. It gives the uh, CSO as a representative of the agency the authority to come in, collect any records, ask questions. Um, you know, basically have access to your facility to conduct their inspection. If an investigator, sorry, if a CSO comes to your site and they do not present credentials and they do not issue a 42, do not let them in. And I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably doing a disservice to the agency, but we must present credentials and must issue the 42 so that we let you know that we are an agent of the government and we are here to conduct the inspection on behalf of the FDA. And as a side note, you cannot make copies of those. So the FDA, the CSO will give you a copy of the 482, but you cannot copy their credentials. You can write down anything that you want, um, but you cannot make a copy of them. So just keep that in mind, too. So that opening interview will consist of that in, in, the investigational process, so how that uh, CSO will conduct their inspection. And this will vary from person to person. So what I tell you is a general overview of how the inspection can be conducted, but please know that things can vary. You know, one CSO may want to do something in a different order than another. So just know that this is not the end-all be-all for conducting inspections. So we want to know, how did the, how did the uh, clinical study proceed at your site? You know, did you have a previous relationship with the sponsor? Um, was this something that you, you, know, you went to a conference and a sponsor approached you? How did you come to conducting this in this uh, clinical study at your site. And if there were any significant protocol deviations. Um, so this is something that the records will tell, but it's, it gives us kind of a heads up before we get into the records, something that we can expect and something that we you know, may want to look a, a little bit further into. And also, we would like to uh, request a copy of a list of, uh, excuse me, a list of studies that the uh, principal investigator has been a part of. So we didn't want to know what is the, the workload of that particular investigator. So if you have one investigator who's got 20 active trials and they've got one study coordinator, that kind of sends up a red flag because we all know how involved conducting these studies can be. So how is one, one physician and, and one study coordinator doing that much work? So it gives us an idea of what the workload of that particular um, investigator looks like. OK. So typically, and I should have bold asterisks underlined typically, but typically three to seven days is the length of 
um, to audit one study. And that can vary based on the number of, um, excuse me, to three to seven days to audit one site. And that will vary based on the number of studies, the number of subjects that are enrolled in each of those studies, uh, the amount of data to be verified. Was this a, you know, uh, a 21 day study or was this a two year dosing study with five years of follow up? If there were specific requirements um, that I received uh, part, as a part of my assignment, um, organization of the study files. So do you have, you know, EMRs here and you have uh, progress notes in another binder? So that plays an important part on how long it will take for the uh, inspections to be uh, conducted. Also, the ability of the site to provide requested copies and information. So as I mentioned, if when we call to pre-announce the inspection and you have uh, records that are housed in another location, that makes it easier for us to request copies of things um, and provide any additional information that the uh, CSO may request. And lastly, the availability of the CI and staff to address any questions. So, um, you know, we understand that schedules and, and, and patients don't stop just because FDA shows up. So if you um, have a conference or, you know, your investigator goes on vacation, all of those can be worked around. So it's important to have someone available, you know, to answer questions that makes our job a lot easier. But we also understand that, again, schedules and things don't stop just because FDA shows up. So we appreciate the sites doing their part to work with us just as much as you appreciate us working with you. All right, so what's covered during the inspection? So generally, the CSO will want to take a look at your facility. They want to take a look at your, excuse me, a look at your, um, your clinic. So how many exam rooms do you have? Uh, do you have a separate laboratory space? Do you have um, an area where you uh, draw blood or anything like that? So we want to make sure that the facility that you are using to conduct the study is adequate for the study that's being conducted. We're also going to take a look at your regulatory documents, so that's your regulatory binder, any other administrative documentation that you may have, um, subject case history and case report forms. So that's going to be the meat and potatoes of the inspection is reviewing subject case histories and case report forms, um, and test article accountability records, so any receipt, any use, any disposition records of that test article are also going to be uh, inspected. Excuse me. Okay, so as I stated before, the CSO will want to take a tour and know how many exam rooms do you have, do you have an adequate space for laboratory um, equipment, if study procedures are being conducted at the time of the inspection, how are they being conducted, is there any cross-contamination or are studies being adequately separated so there is no confusion between what samples are being reserved for which study or particular subject. And we want to know what's the, the storage conditions of the investigational product. So if it's a, you know, a, a, um, a narcotic, is that being stored appropriately per not only FDA guidelines, but DEA guidelines. So we want to make sure that the sites are um, storing uh, the investigational product per the protocol, so temperature and humidity requirements. Um, and actually, uh, we also look at if the uh, investigational product is being separated by study. So if we review your records and we say, hey, there's um, uh, dosing um, issues here. You know, a particular subject was dosed with a, uh, a um, drug from a different study. That's something we're also going to want to evaluate as well. All right, review of regulatory records. I'm going to go through this quickly because there's a lot of them. We look at all of them. I just want to make sure you have them there. <laughs> so uh, Farinac uh, and, and Judith, uh, they went through the 1572. That's something we collect and make sure that is available on site. The original protocol, we want to make sure that we're looking at the right study. Um, any amendments that have been uh, submitted or approved by the IRB, uh, informed consent forms, any recruitment materials. So we want to make sure that all of these uh, materials that were um, used during the study were um, maintained and also approved by the IRB. Uh, we also look at sponsor correspondence, so any email, communication, newsletters. This gives us an idea about how the study was conducted. Were there any issues with adverse event or protocol uh, deviations? 
Um, so reviewing the sponsor correspondence gives us a, a quick look into um, how that went during the uh, course of the clinical trial. More regulatory records. Monitoring reports, again, statement of the investigator, uh, investigator agreement. I will just say, <laughs> investigator agreement is on the device side. So since I'm in CDRH now, my, my boss wanted to make sure I threw that device <laughs> part in there. But your 1572 is what you're going to find for um, drug studies. Financial disclosure forms, um, all informed consent forms used during the study, staff resumes, any training records. So we want to make sure that whoever was involved in the conduct of the clinical trial was adequately trained. They have the proper education. They have the proper um, uh, licensure uh, to uh, be in charge of whatever they were delegated during that uh, study in laboratory certifications and reference values. All right. For all you investigators out there, um, you sign your name on the 1572, no, you, you are responsible. You are responsible for the conduct of that particular um, trial under 21 CFR Part 312. And so it's your responsibility to make sure that the IRB has approved your study before you start doing any study procedures. You want to make sure that informed consent is properly obtained by the, um, by the site for, for each uh, subject. The study is conducted, conducted in accordance with the protocol. The investigational product is being uh, controlled. Um, and that accurate, complete, and current case histories are uh, collected and maintained. So as I said before, um, the investigator uh, is ultimately responsible for any regulatory violations um, that occur from failure to, main, to meet the um, requirements of, of 21 CFR Part 312. So I know there has been some discussion about study coordinators and them having a large part in the conduct of the studies. And are study coordinators responsible? And I know there is some talk about um, having them uh, have more of a, a responsible uh, part in you know, regulatory-wise. But I don't know if those regulations are going to come or not. But I do believe that that's part of the discussion. Um, for uh, responsibilities. And so with that, how does one investigator do everything that's related to a study? It's not possible, as we all know. And so the investigator will uh, delegate a specific study tasks to different uh, staff that they have on their uh, on conducting the clinical trial. And so a qualified physician should be making uh, and it should be responsible for all uh, decisions re related to uh, medical care, adverse events. Um, and so your protocol, if it doesn't um, specify uh, a physician should be conducting medical exams, use your um, licensure requirements um, to guide you as, to, as far as who should be conducting a medical exam or who should be reviewing adverse events. So if it's not clearly delineated in the protocol, um, your licensure um, requirements is a, a good um, guide for that, as well as your clinical and medical judgment. So um, like I said, adverse event adjudication, um, any medical, e uh, medical evaluations, adjustments of uh, dosing, things of that nature. And so some examples of inappropriate delegation and de dependent on the type of um, study that you're conducting, this may vary. Um, so use your, you know, consult your protocol, uh, consult your, your medical monitors, um, screening medical histories and eligibility. Eligibility should definitely be an investigator um, made decision. Um, physical exams, uh, adverse event evaluation and qualification, uh, assessment of study endpoints. So um, this is another big uh, you know, investigator uh, decision that should be made, and obtaining informed consent. So with obtaining informed consent, I know this is a, 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 um, a process that is generally delegated to study coordinators and, you know, other um, general staff, which is definitely okay, but you want to make sure that the principal, principal investigator is available to the subjects to ask any questions or, you know, just clarify any issues or, or, or questions that they may have related to what they're signing themselves up for. All right. So with the delegation of those study tasks, um, the task that is being performed, um, any start or stop dates, the 
especially the, the individual assigned to the task, and you want to make sure that that person is trained adequately, bless you, for the, um, the task that they have been delegated. So um, delegate, but make sure you are sure that the person who the task has been dele delegated to is qualified to perform that task. All right, so reviewing of subject case histories, and this is where the FDA uh, CSO will spend the majority of their time, um, and they will um, review um, they will review uh, the case histories for um, subjects that are generally in the beginning, middle, and end that were enrolled in the beginning, middle, and end of the uh, clinical trial. And so this allows the the CSO to document to assess the documentation of the informed consent process, um, any compliance with the inclusion or exclusion criteria, uh, which can involve you know, medical history, laboratory results, study-specific tests, um, and most importantly, compliance with the protocol. So dosing, the use of concomitant medications, um, any um, uh, protocol-specific tests. So that is where the majority of the time will be spent to ensure that the protocol was followed um, with each subject. And in addition, uh, adverse events and reporting. Um, and this allows the FDA CSO to determine what the level of that investigator's um, uh, oversight of the study was. So were the clinical, or excuse me, were the study coordinators, were they running the show? Or was the investigator actually reviewing documentations? Were they conducting the physical exams? Were they reviewing any adverse events that have been reported by the subjects? So this gives us uh, the opportunity to, um, to assess the uh, investigator's oversight of the study. And as I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, um, not only is it important for the uh, FDA CSO to assess how safe um, the welfare of the subjects during the study, but we also want to verify the, um, the validity of the data that's being submitted in support of that particular application. So the FDA CSO will have a, generally a set of data that was sent um, by the sponsor to the agency. So they will use that data that was sent to, um, they will use the source documents at the sites to verify the data that was sent to the FDA. So that allows us to verify primary efficacy endpoints, safety endpoints, any adverse events that were reported. So that is um, in addition to ensuring that the subjects were, um, their safety and welfare were maintained during the study, the data validation um, is what the FDA investigator will use the, the data validation is a process that the FDA CSO will um, conduct to, to ensure that the uh, review division can depend on the data that was received in that particular application. All right, subject selection. So as I said, generally the CSO will take a look at subjects that were enrolled in the beginning, middle, and end of the study to um, assess the compliance with that particular, um, to assess the compliance of the study. And depending on the type of study that's um, being reviewed at the site, this may vary. If you have a population that is prone to more adverse events, we may look at a larger number of subjects. If we find that there were um, a significant number of protocol deviations, that may increase the number of subjects that we, that we review. But generally, we take a look at subjects um, from the beginning, middle, and end of the study, and then we increase our scope if necessary. All right, we've gone over this before. Uh, 1572, so we do require that um, the FDA 1572 um, be collected during the, uh, the inspection. So you want to have the 1572 on site. It doesn't have to be the original copy. It just needs to be a copy of the FDA 1572 that was signed by the investigator. So this must be done prior to shipment of the uh, investigational product to the site. So that should be done before there's any conduct of the, um, of the, uh, the study at this site, any um, dosing of subjects, the 1572 should already be in place. And if there are changes um, to the, I believe Farinac went over, if there are any changes to the investigator, sub-investigator, there are, um, there are, uh, that's weird. There are um, changes that need to be reported on the 1572, 
Um, but if there are changes to laboratories or uh, sub-investigators, I believe they don't need to be submitted. That, that's correct, right? Okay, let's check in. Okay. Um, so as Farinac went over, so any investigators, sub-investigators that have significant influence on that study, they must um, be listed as an um, a investigator on the 1572. And as I said before, they, they need to be maintained on the site because those will be collected during the inspection. <laughs> device studies. <laughs> uh, the investigator agreement is only for device studies. Uh, he's actually retiring. <laughs> okay. So the FDA CSO, they have um, gone over the regulatory binders. They've gone over um, the subject case histories. And they have determined that there is going to be a 483 to be issued. So these are a list of the most common FDA 483 issues, uh, um, deficiencies, and in no particular order of importance or anything like that. Um, we find that um, failure to follow the investigational plan is the most common. Um, it's, it's kind of a catch-all for any failure to follow the protocol. So um, subject eligibility, if there were ineligible subjects enrolled, if there were any protocol-specific tests that were not completed or, or conducted, um, inappropriate delegation. So it's important that you refer to your protocol because that is the document that the FDA CSO will be using to say this was not a particular, this was not a protocol-specific task was required, that was conducted. Failure to prepare or maintain adequate or accurate case histories. So if you don't maintain adequate, accurate case histories, how can you be sure that it, the procedure was actually conducted? So it's important to document, document, document. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, and it, it's OK that the documents aren't perfect and clean. And you know we don't expect that. And in fact, <laughs> If we show up and, and everything is, you know, in a nice white paper and there are no, you know, bins in the paper or everything looks too clean, it kind of, it sets off a, a red flag. You know, we expect that things happen. You know, someone's drinking coffee and they spill it on their paper. All of these things are okay. Don't throw the paper out. Don't rewrite it. Don't toss it. Well, if you're going to rewrite it, keep the original. So what's the point of rewriting it? So, you know, it's okay that there are mistakes. Um, and so I, I say that to, to emphasize the importance of maintaining adequate and accurate case histories. So again, if you make a mistake, initial, line through, date it, a reason for the change, those are all things that are OK. Don't feel like your records need to be perfect, because that will, again, set off a red flag. OK. Um, inadequate investigational product disposition records. So the, um, the, the investigational product must be tracked from receipt, use, and disposition, whether that is destruction or return to the sponsor. That has to be maintained so that we can be sure that anything that was sent to the site was either kept, it was maintained in the correct storage conditions, it was used by the site uh, for a subject, or it was sent back to the firm, or it was destroyed in some way. So uh, that is important so that we know that subjects were adequately dosed and that the uh, investigational product was accounted for during the course of the study. Uh, failure to, make, to obtain informed consent or informed consent improperly documented. I can't stress enough to double check your subject signatures before you let them leave um, because I've found that there are, are cases where sites feel that, oh, the subject, they forgot to sign or they forgot to date. Let me just have them back date. Don't do that. It's OK if they didn't do whatever they were supposed to do on the date that they were consented. Um, have them sign again. Don't go back to the original and say, oh, well, we're just going to back date it to the date that they were supposed to sign the informed consent. So I'm not encouraging you to write notes to file, but in the event that you need to write one, that is OK. Um, just don't backdate. So you want to make sure that before the subjects leave your facility that they have signed and dated the informed consent form properly. Um, I can't stress that enough. 
And that's prior to any study procedures being conducted, right? Uh, fair to your report to the IRB, any, um, any unanticipated problems involving risk to human subjects? Um, and the IRBs will have different requirements, um, reporting requirements. Um, whether it's 24 hours or five days or at the next annual report. So be sure that you are um, checking with the IRB that is providing oversight of your study what their reporting requirements are um, for any adverse events or unanticipated problems. All right, so we made it to the close out. It's all over, right? Okay. Um, so the, uh, the FDCSO, they will go through and um, summarize what was covered during the inspection. And if you feel like the uh, CSO is not communicating with you well enough during the course of the inspection, feel free to ask them for a summary at the end of every day. Hey, was there anything that you found? Um, is there anything that we can get you? Were there any records missing? This will um, facilitate the closeout meeting and make it a way less painful process. So again, the CSO will summarize what was covered during the inspection. If there was a Form 483 to be issued, they will issue at that, at that point. You can provide a verbal response. Um, I found that most uh, sites kind of want to digest the 483 before they say anything, so they can um, provide a written response. And uh, I believe Fairnax said that is completely voluntary. There is no um, requirement to respond to the 483, but we highly, 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 highly suggest that you do within 15 days. Um, discussion of any verbal observations. And a verbal observation is not an observation that is not as important as an observation that goes on a 43. Um, we just feel that it has less impact on the um, safety and uh, the safety of the subjects or the, um, the, the um, integrity of the data. So um, not to say that they're not important, but those are not, um, I just don't want to say as important, but they just didn't warrant going on the 483 and any potential action. So we will let you know that you know, this is not the final classification of the inspection. It has to, over, has to go through several layers of review, and that a final determination will be made um, at a later date. And so with that, the review process may lead to some further regulatory actions, be it a warning letter or untitled letter, um, a NIDPO or disqualification. Um, and so we'll explain that those actions are possible. Um, how the review process will go, and then a classification letter that you will receive. All right, once the inspection is over, after you take in some air, <laughs> um, um, again, we highly, highly encourage sites to respond to the 483. Um, it's really a good faith measure on behalf of your site to the agency, and it shows that um, you have acknowledge the issues that were found at your site and that you have intentions on bringing your site into compliance and continuing to follow the regulations. Um, and begin implementing any corrective actions if you can do so. So some things may happen and that's, that's the end of it, but if you find that you have any systemic issues at your site, um, implementing corrective actions um, is good because that way if you ever have another FDA inspection, you will be ready. And then wait patiently to receive a copy of your report. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a date. I don't have a time frame. I don't have any of those. Um, but it will come. And if it doesn't come, contact the FDA CSO. And they should be able to get some information for you. Um, but it will come. All right. So in summary, please, please, please follow your investigational plan. This is, and when I say investigational plan, I'm referring to the protocol. So this is the document, again, that the FDA CSO will be referring to to conduct their inspection. Um, document, document, document. If it didn't, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Thank you. <laughs> Don't wait for us to show up to get ready. So you've gotten some good information um, today about you know, what FDA is looking for. Um, hopefully, I've given you some information on what to expect when we come in the door. So be sure that you're preparing your, your staff and, um, and, and, and yourself if an FDA inspection were to happen. And then make it easy for us. Not easy, but, you know, don't not give us what we ask for. Um, that makes the inspection more difficult on both sides. 
Um, I'm a very transparent person, so I don't like to hide things from sites. If I need something, if I feel like something's wrong, I will let you know right away. That way we can both see if there's anything that can be done about it, any documentation that can be provided. And so this facilitates, facilitates the inspection. It makes things a lot easier, and um, I greatly appreciate it. So here are some resources for you. Um, the GCP start page. The Bio Research Monitoring Information page, you will find there um, a document called a Compliance Program, and that's how FDA CSOs conduct their inspections. Nothing we do is a secret. So if you want to know why we do what we do, a Compliance Program is a good place to start. Um, some guidance for industry, these links are all available, and that's me. Um, I don't know who that number goes to the second one. <laughs> and uh, any questions? All right, thank you. And we have just a few minutes, two minutes, 45 seconds for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of the online questions because Nicole is one of the presenters who will be able to stick around for the rest of the day. That one-on-one -on -one question session that we're going to have from 4 to 4.30, if you've got specific questions for Nicole, you'll be able to get heard then as well, but let's start with our first online question, please. Okay. First question is, are warning letters and untitled letters classified as VAI or OAIs? OAI. Official, official action indicated. Okay. Next. Okay. Second question, what pre-inspection preparation do you do before going to the site? Do you look at the IND or at other aspects? Um, so, F Field CSO does not have access to the IND, so we are at the mercy of what the centers. It's weird now because I'm not an ORA anymore. I keep saying we, but it's not we, it's them. It's a brief new world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there, there you go. <laughs> so the field does not have access to the IND. They are at the mercy of what the centers provide by way of background materials, and that can vary based on the assignment. So, and it'll generally include the protocol informed consent forms, um, the data listings, um, did I say informed consent forms, data listings, protocol, um, any information about issues that were reported by the sponsor or the IRB. So that's generally kind of the, the batch of things that we review prior. And the firm's inspectional history. How did I forget that? So if the firm is, if that site has been inspected before, we'll go back and review the um, previous report to see if you know, how was their compliance, if there were issues, if there were things that needed to be um, followed up on, any 43 items that needed to be um, verified that they were, com um, they were reviewed and completed by the uh, site. So that's what they look at. Okay, okay. next online question, please. Okay. In case of a warning letter, is the EIR issued before or after the warning letter? <gasps> um, that's a good question. I don't know if there's any... <laughs> Um, in my mind, I believe that the EIR is issued after. So the um, centers for the BIMO program, the centers are responsible for issuing the warning letters. So that happens before the firm will receive a copy of the report. Yes, I'm sure about that. And we've got time for one more question. Okay. If you have an ESG account for CEDAR, for EICSR, can you use this gateway for CDR CDRH? If, um, you add a medical device? I don't know what any of those acronyms mean. <laughs> yes? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. There we go. And the answer is yes. All right. See, that was easier than thought. Please help me thank Nicole for coming to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.